muted. Recording. Very good. Everyone, I'm Ira Feldman. I'm the Managing Director of the Sustainability Curriculum Consortium, and I'm also a member of the ASHI Advisory Council. I'm serving as a webinar organizer today, along with Tom Bauman of Interactive Leader, who is also an, a, an Advisory Council member of the Sustainability Curriculum Consortium. I want to thank the many of you who are joining us today for the third webinar in our pedagogy series. We are truly delighted by the overwhelmingly positive response to this series, which SCC is presenting in collaboration with AGI. We welcome your feedback and your suggestions for additional curriculum and faculty development activities. As you know, this is a four webinar series. We led off with Susan Santone. Two weeks ago, Jess led her first session. Jess is the session leader today. And next week on July 19th, Susan Santone will conclude this series. If you've registered for the series, you're registered for all four webinars. If you believe your colleagues could benefit from the remaining webinar, please do pass along the registration information. Everyone should have received a link via email of the recording of last week's webinar. Uh, the links to the recordings of all the webinars uh, will be posted on both the Sustainability Curriculum Consortium and ASHE websites. You should check out our website for more details on our mission, our partners, and our various upcoming programs. Our website URL is curriculumforsustainability.com, curriculumforsustainability.com. The Sustainability Curriculum Consortium is an ASHI member organization. We're not an ASHI program, but we're proud to be partnering with ASHI in delivering this pedagogy webinar series. We expect that this collaboration will lead to further collaboration with our friends at ASHI. Special thanks go to Julian Dotremont smith and Dida Sergi, who have helped tremendously in promoting and organizing this webinar series. I want to mention two specific ASHI activities. ASHI has its Campus Sustainability Hub on its website. That's a one-stop shop for ASHI members to access toolkits and resource collections about all aspects of sustainability in higher education, including academics, operations, and governance. The URL for the Campus Sustainability Hub is simply hub .ashi.org. The other major ASHI activity I'd like to support is the ASHI Annual Conference. It's coming up in October, October 9th through 12th in Baltimore. Worth noting that early bird registration ends in a couple of days. It ends on July 15th and the URL for the ASHI Conference is simply conference.ashi.org. So back to today's webinar. The title is Sustainability at the Heart of Learning, Aligning Sustainability with Institutional, Departmental, and Classroom Values for Better Student Outcomes. Jess Garrier will lead this session. And as we have described it, covers the intellectual work of designing, delivering, and evaluating transdisciplinary sustainability curriculum, together with the practical work of enacting sustainability knowledge and skills in the physical environment, both essential to education for sustainability. But unless the head and the hands are connected with the heart, the cultural, socio-political, moral values of learning communities, they can only reach so far. So today, we will exchange ideas and practices for tapping into what moves educators and leaders teaching sustainability from the inside out. Let me briefly introduce you to Jess Garrier, if you're not already familiar with her and her work. 
Jess, of course, is the Sustainability Curriculum Consortium's Director of Learning and Practice. She's also a PhD Fellow, Project Director, and Adjunct Instructor at Antioch, New England. Jess has over 15 years experience in higher education, most recently as the Sustainability Coordinator and Educator at Franklin Pierce University, where she oversaw the Sustainability Center and the Sustainability Certificate Program. In addition to recognition for her professional work, all of which is detailed on our SEC website, Jess has served as the Chair of the Monadnock Farm and Community Coalition, Project Manager for the Monadnock Food Co-op, and a volunteer for several organizations on issues of food security, community resilience, and the environment. Last but not least, Jess is a leader of the Monadnock Roller Derby. So, as Jess is connect conducting her presentation, uh, please submit any questions or comments in the question box on your control panel. Uh, Tom Bauman and I will be reviewing them during the webinar and we will tee those up for Jess to respond and with that I think I've said enough and I'm happy to present my friend and colleague Jess Garrier. Jess? Great, thank you Ira and thank you Tom. Uh, also thank you to everyone who's here today as I mentioned in the previous webinar um, I want to really acknowledge that as sustainability educators, leaders, and people who are doing important, creative, and difficult work, um, that there are many ways you could have chosen to spend this afternoon here in New Hampshire. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous summer day, and so I want to really appreciate your time and look forward to our session together. Um, thanks, Ira, also for the introduction. Some of you may be wondering, um, maybe the not so obvious links between roller derby and issues of community resilience and sustainability. Um, and we don't necessarily need to get into all of those thoughts today, but if anybody does have questions about what that has to do with my outlook on leadership and community organizing and all of those other uh, skills that are involved in sustainability leadership, um, feel free to send those questions as well as those that are more relevant uh, directly to the sustainability at the Heart of Learning webinar session that we're about to begin. So thank you. Um, my slides are not forwarding. There they are. Okay. So I've written the uh, description of the session. I will skip over that now. Thank you, Ira, for your introduction of it. I do want to talk a little bit about why I selected this topic as the third a webinar session, and I want to introduce a, a quote by David Suzuki. Some of you may be familiar with his work. If you're not, I want to highly recommend The Sacred Balance, Rediscovering Our Place in Nature, and or any of his other published work or, um, or talks. Um, and in this particular book, David says, at this critical juncture in our history on Earth, we are asking the wrong questions. Uh, we ask a lot of questions in academia. How do we do this? What do we need to know about that, right? Uh, but David's advice is that instead of asking how do we reduce the deficit, how do we carve out a niche in the global economy, we should be asking what's an economy for and how much is enough? We seem to have forgotten the real things that matter and must establish the real bottom line of non-negotiable needs in order to regain a balance with our surroundings. And I've highlighted non-negotiable needs there because I think that it speaks to what we mean about sustainability and its value in educating for sustainability. So who we are, um, we've brought together today hopefully a uh, community of educators for sustainability or educators for sustainable development. Um, again, as I mentioned in my last webinar, you may or may not have started your professional career thinking of yourself as an educator for sustainability. Um, but somewhere along the line, hopefully you've begun to identify as such and identify with this work. And so this webinar is geared toward educators at every level and in every kind of institution whose teaching and uh, professional goals and visions have something to do with the goals and visions of sustainability and sustainable development. 
And as higher education professionals, you are leaders for change, agents for change, and you're people with creativity, skill, and purpose. I'll introduce myself a, a little bit more uh, as far as who I am and what I value, since this session is on the value of sustainability and aligning our work with those values so that we can reach our students and our communities in a much more impactful way. So I divided this up into a couple of different sections. Uh, by the way, you're going to see a little green asterisk on your screen about who I am and what I value. And down at the bottom, you'll see the little message that says, try this. So throughout this session, there will be some of these screens that say, try this. And my recommendation for you, and hopefully this is valuable to you in your own educational practice, is that you can take these uh, processes and use them for reflection on your own time at the end of the day, uh, in the middle of the day over a lunch meeting with colleagues. Uh, introduce them to the classroom or the laboratory or the field where you work. Introduce them to a committee meeting. And use them as a way to both reflect and identify uh, what's at the center of your work, and also as a way to cultivate perhaps a new conversation to bridge a pedagogical or departmental or administrative boundary of some kind. Uh, these are practices and processes that I've picked up in my own professional development, uh, whether they are at professional conferences, retreats, um, and various classes and venues that I've been at. And so in addition to hearing me talk about uh, the, the ideas and concepts that I've developed, uh, what I'm hoping to deliver here is a practice and a tool for you to carry on forward um, after the webinar. So um, the ways that I identify, I identify as a sustainability educator. Um, as such, I am kind of a, an interdisciplinary liaison. Some of you may think of yourselves in, in that way too. Um, we've talked previously in this webinar series about the ways in which sustainability can be perceived in academia as well as in other sectors as kind of a subspecialty of the environmental study studies and environmental sciences, uh, which it's not. We know that it's much more broad. Um, and so sustainability educators often find themselves walking those, those lines and blurring those boundaries between the disciplines. So that's part of my identity as well. Um, in that way, I'm also a community, community builder. Uh, that's something I practice. And I'm also an adult learner. Um, whether you have a background in adult learning, adult learning theory or not, um, the simple version of that, at least for me, is that um, my, I want to go out and learn things that have application to the real world. I want to learn things that I can actually do something with. Uh, you might have students, if you are an educator in the classroom, um, who that's one of their, their complaints about the education that they get, if they have complaints about the education they're getting, is what am I going to do with this, right? So that speaks to the kind of learners that we are. And I bet that some of you can identify with that too. What am I going to do with this information? Um, as far as my practice, um, things that I value are community-based uh, experiential and service-based learning. Um, I really enjoy course planning. Um, I know that that's not everyone's favorite as, as far as, uh, you know, your, your job description and the amount of time that you spend on certain things, but uh, for me, course planning is a pretty exciting part of the, the school year, the academic year for me, as well as evaluation. Um, not a fancy word by any means, but um, I think evaluation can be really interesting, especially when we consider its impacts for the larger picture of our work. Um, very interested in collaborative leadership as both a practice and as a concept and try to incorporate that into both my educational and nonprofit work. And in my doctoral work, I am interested in food systems especially um, because I feel that food systems bring together many different interests including climate change, community resilience, uh, culture, social issues, economic issues. But specifically, I see them as gateways into these larger conversations, these larger issues and opportunities in sustainability for other 
researchers, those gateways might be energy or economic issues, uh, but for me, food systems are the, the gateway. Things that I try to cultivate in my practice are systems thinking, ecological thinking, and critical thinking. And I value learning environments that foster resilience, whether that's on the individual scale, the communal scale, or the ecological scale. So the reason that I go into a little bit more detail about who I am and what I value is, like I said, um, not necessarily to introduce myself and make it all about me, although uh, you do want to have an idea of who I am. Um, but again, to give you a practice, something that you can bring into those committee meetings, into the classroom, and into your own professional work, um, because this is, this is a point where it can begin. So I want to talk about the goals for this, this webinar, at least my goals. Um, for the next hour or so, I would like for us to consider our, ourselves as a community of practice, at least uh, for the time being. Um, by the end of this webinar, hopefully you will have a really useful set of questions to carry forward. Um, I guess one thing I should say is that if you are looking for a webinar that gives you a recipe for aligning your, uh, your, your curriculum or your teaching practice with the values of your particular classroom or university committee, um, I'm not going to give you a recipe. Um, I uh, don't know enough about each individual's university or program or course to be able to do that. Um, and so what this webinar ten, intends to do instead is to provide a set of questions to help get you there. Uh, as well as a set of practices uh, like the one that we just did and a couple more that I'll introduce in just a moment here. Um, the other thing I'll provide that's hopefully valuable to you is, toward the end of the webinar, a set of resources to support this process. Um, it can be an individual process if you choose it to be, if you're just looking to uh, support your individual professional development. Um, but if you are looking for resources to join others in the endeavor of educating for sustainability, or if you're working on a team of some kind, um, to develop curricula or to do some evaluation. Um, hopefully these are resources that will be supportive to you in that. Okay, so um, hopefully you are near where you can grab a couple of sheets of paper and something to write with. If you don't have access to that, maybe you have uh, the ability to open up a separate tab on your computer and open up a word processing Doc, uh, program or a Google document, um, even if you are in a cafe and all you have is a napkin and, and a pen. Um, just a place to kind of jot down some questions that come up for you and some uh, comments that you'd like to contribute to the discussion. Um, I know I've been mo doing most of the talking so far, but in a couple of moments here, I will hope that people will contribute to the discussion in the following ways. Um, so taking just a minute here to, if you haven't already, get that piece of paper or that extra window open so that you can do uh, the work of the next set of activities that I'll introduce. So questions to keep in mind as we are going through the discussion so that you can write these down as we go along. How can I see myself piloting or modifying or evaluating some of these questions and practices that I'll present in this webinar in my own educational context, whatever that is, whether you are in a, um, a teaching faculty member, um, a dean or other kind of academic administrator, uh, a librarian, or any other kind of educational professional involved in educating for sustainability. What opportunities and challenges might I anticipate as a result of bringing these questions and practices into the work of EFS and ESD. So not just what will I do with this, but what will what I do affect others in that educational context? Uh, what opportunities might that create? What challenges might that create? And third question is, who else might I want to engage in these questions, in these practices, and how might I want to engage them? So I offer these first three questions as things to keep in mind as we're going through 
uh, the webinar session together. And as I said, hopefully you have a, a notebook or something to, to practice with. So the agenda, the order of things we'll, we'll go through in this webinar. The first activity that we'll do together is a mapping sustainability activity. Um, that's what that pen and paper is for. Uh, then a short uh, head, hands, and heart um, speaking to the description of the webinar itself. Then I have some hard questions for you. And uh, hopefully this isn't intimidating for you because as educators we love hard questions, right? These are challenging questions that get people to the edges of what they know or the edges of what they think they know so that they can stretch those edges. So hopefully hard questions is more enticing for you than intimidating. Um, we'll revisit those maps after we get through uh, the head, hands, and heart as well as the hard questions and take a look at those sustainability maps and try to identify some leverage points. And then fifth, I will uh, explain some resources for our ES, EFS and ESD work. And if at any point you have questions or issues come up, again, just one more reminder to put those into the chat box so that Tom and Ira can field those questions. Okay, so everybody ready? Hopefully you have a piece of paper or an open tab. And what we're going to do is get our creative minds going and sketch a pedagogical concept map. Um, this is going to be super simple. Scribbling is going to be encouraged. There are no right or wrong answers here. This is really just a, a way to get your, get your thoughts flowing. And you may or may not have actually mapped out or drawn a picture of the way that you teach sustainability before. Um, if you have, this will be an opportunity for you to take another crack at it because chances are it never is going to look the same way twice. Um, for me, whenever I try to map out an idea, as I do frequently, being a doctoral student and my conceptual frameworks are kind of evolving all the time, um, it looks different, a little bit different every time I do it. If you haven't done a concept map before, and you might be thinking, oh, I cannot draw even a stick figure, I'm not artistic, I'm not creative. Just don't listen to that voice. Just go ahead and get that piece of paper out. And uh, even just if it's words with lines connecting the words, that's all you have to do. Um, this shouldn't be difficult at all. What's going to be on this map will be different for everyone. I have actually uh, two maps that I will give you in my scribble writing. Um, just to show you for an example, but it's don't don't feel that you have to follow my map. This is going to be different for everybody. What you want to include on there, and you can start brainstorming and doodling now, is uh, anything that has to do with your sustainability pedagogy. That may be a course that you're teaching now, a course that you've taught in the past, a course that you might like to teach in the future, a course that doesn't even exist yet. It could be the program that that course belongs in, uh, or ag again, a program that doesn't exist yet. Um, you want to draw any relationships or connections you see between uh, the course and the program, the school or university in which it belongs, and start thinking outward and consider the context for that program. Does this program take place on a farm? Does it take place in an urban setting? Uh, is this geared more toward uh, returning students or undergraduates or graduate students? Um, is it based more in the environmental humanities or is it more based in a technical uh, context, in an engineering school perhaps? And start drawing the connections that you see uh, within the program as well as outside of the connection to the world outside of that, that teaching environment. Um, again, you see that green star as a try this kind of activity. This is something that you should feel free to take with you after the webinar um, in your committee work or in the classroom or over wherever your environmental um, practice is, educational practice. Thank you. Okay, so here's a concept map that took me maybe 10 or 15 minutes to come up with. Um, I told you it was messy, so please do not hold yourself to any kind of 
unreasonable standard of artistic uh, ability here. Um, so I'm a very visual learner. So this kind of activity works for me. If you're not necessarily a visual learner, uh, challenge your own edges here and, uh, and try this out. It's all an experiment. So what my eye is drawn to in, the, in this map is the very center where it says community garden. So I picture myself on this map in the community garden. And what I'm doing is, if you look one, uh, one inch or so above that to educational institutions, I'm part of an educational institution that places individuals like myself in a community garden where the business and nonprofit community there on the left comes in, volunteers come in, some of them are from uh, the educational institutions, some are from businesses. And this community garden is used as a resource to grow organic uh, vegetables, fruits, and herbs, um, and teach people about the concepts and practices of gardening. Um, and the produce from that garden goes to low-income and low-access populations. So these are folks who may be homeless, they may have a, a disability, um, they simply may be low income, but for whatever reason, they are in need and cannot provide for themselves, at the, at the, for the moment at least, um, fresh organic produce. So the community garden provides a way for the, the, the learning about larger issues of the local food system. So you'll see local food system down toward the bottom there is where I put it. And so the community garden is embedded within the local food system, which also includes things like farms and stores and the transportation system between those places. Uh, it includes the soil. It includes the local watershed. You name it. Um, if you extend outward from the local food system, you see that branching off into all kinds of larger sustainability issues. So economic policies, land use decisions, uh, health and well-being, social capital. Um, those, those kinds of sustainability issues can be approached from other directions too, but for me, where I'm standing and where I'm situated in, in my map, the community garden is kind of where it all begins. It's a place where people build social capital. It's a place where they can, uh, depending on where they're working, um, get outside and enjoy the, the many health benefits and uh, social wellness benefits of being outdoors. It's a way to alleviate an economic pressure that exists on low income and low access uh, populations, people who are food insecure. Um, and it's a way to start addressing some issues of food justice and environmental justice. So someone else who might also be working in the community garden might draw a completely different map, right? Because they may might not be uh, coming at it from the approach of a researcher or a project director where, where I am, but they may be standing somewhere else within this map. Maybe for them, they're in the upper left corner where it says stewardship. And for them, that's where they hold value. That's where they identify. That's where they practice. That's where they're trying to cultivate change. So what I did with this map and what I would encourage you to do, keep on scribbling by all means as things come to you um, and as you uh, think of different uh, landmarks or concepts, so to speak, as that, that belong on your map, keep going with that. And what I'm going to do is just show you one more layer that I added to this map. What I decided to do was identify which areas are um, the most valuable for me. So that's with my green marker. Again, messy is just fine for this. So don't judge your artwork. Just keep going with it. Um, so what does that look like from an education for sustainability standpoint? Where is the education for sustainability part of this map? So I colored in educational institutions, right? Because that's, that's where I'm employed and that's where I'm working. That's the, other than the community garden, that's where I'm most identified. And I decided to highlight how that is connected to the local food system and then through the local food system to these larger issues of sustainability. So the other layer that I put in this besides the, the green is some additional words and phrases around the perimeter 
that connect the education part to the local food system. So it's things like conferences that I might go to and present my research, uh, publications that I might be working on with my advisor and the graduate students that I work with, uh, case studies that we might put into uh, a collection of case studies or publish individually or present to the community. Um, we might involve some of those low income and low access populations into some of our community forums as we have done in the past. Um, pilot projects, service learning, uh, various kinds of research, as well as program evaluation throughout the whole year, both summative and formative program evaluation. These are all activities and components of my teaching and learning, my pedagogy practice, that connect the education part to the larger sustainability part. So the reason for all of this is to get down to what is it that we really value in our, our sustainability practice. Here's a second map. Again, keep working on your own map, or if you can think of a, a, another example from your own experience or one that you would like to create, um, put that one away, grab a second sheet of paper, and try another map if you like, or keep working on the first one. Either is fine. This map comes from my experience previous to entering the PhD program as the sustainability coordinator and educator at Franklin Pierce University. I did a little bit differently, uh, used curvy lines instead of straight lines, um, but tried to show with those lines what the relationship was between my area of work and the other areas of the university, where I didn't necessarily have uh, management or authority over, but was able to connect students, faculty, staff, and larger community together around these sustainability issues. So. My primary responsibility was administering the Sustainability Center, so I started with that right in the middle. Uh, my position uh, managed that center and both directed and was directed by uh, the Sustainability Council. The Sustainability Council had um, various, various membership over the years, uh, almost always had uh, a few academic faculty from different areas facilities, food service, residential life, IT office, um, sometimes student affairs and, and other offices as well. The Sustainability Center is where the Sustainability Certificate Program was administered. And in that certificate program, students worked on a whole variety of different projects and earned a certificate for doing so. Their majors toward the lower right ranged from environmental science and management to political science and communication. I remember one semester we had um, something like three quarters of the students in one of the sustainability seminars were uh, either from political science or communication, which uh, was a really interesting experience. Uh, they, taught, they taught me actually a lot about uh, poli-sci and communication. Um, so they work on projects varying from trails and advocating for conservation of land and water to increasing recycling rates, um, protecting water, preventing waste, or representing sustainability messages through the arts, uh, studying the environmental uh, history of a place. Um, the Sustainability Center also was kind of what connected the, uh, the students and faculty working on sustainability issues with the larger community. So visitors to campus would, um, uh, would experience the sustainability features of the campus through the Sustainability Center's work. And that, that could be anything from the, uh, the signs created by students to identify um, uh, landmarks particular to a sustainability issue. Um, one example of that would be the green door of the residential life um, the, well, the residence uh, that was specifically geared toward uh, sustainable living. Um, and things like uh, partnering with local farms, uh, educating, use relate, educating the public on issues related to a, a natural gas pipeline, um, helping to create a pollinator habitat on campus. That was uh, kind of the hub of sustainability on campus. Um, 
So I did kind of the same thing that I did with the first map. I added another layer, which I'll put up now. And took a closer look at just one part of the map, the Sustainability Certificate Program, and did another layer just to show a little bit more detail as far as the sequence that students went through um, to earn that certificate. They went through a Sustainability Seminar course, which is a one-credit course, kind of an informal uh, introduction into large and small sustainability issues. Then I helped the students coordinate um, which of the green threads they would incorporate in their courses from other majors. So these are courses that faculty had identified as having some kind of sustainability con uh, uh, content, whether that was a chapter, um, whether it was a large like semester-long project that a student could take in the direction of uh, a sustainability theme or some other component of that course that was identified by the course instructor as having green content. Then the students would take three of those, which also counted for their major or their minor, and would wrap those into a sustainability project, which they would first propose and get feedback on, and then refine and actually implement and evaluate. So it was a pretty, a pretty intensive uh, process for them, but they um, had connections, and that's the green dots that are all over the place there, <laughs> the connections between the sustainability project and all of the other parts of uh, the sustainability presence on that particular campus. Okay, so hopefully by now you've had a chance to scribble out a map of your own. Um, if you haven't, or if you are just not feeling up to it today, because um, this can be a little bit daunting if you haven't tried it before, Go ahead and try it at some point. Um, the, the next step for that is to take a look at that map um, individually or with a colleague and try to identify what features stand out most in our concept maps. Uh, the reason for doing this is because this will help us to identify and orient ourselves to what value we place on sustainability in our teaching and what that has to do with the broader context in which we are teaching. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So if, for example, in my last map, if I had chosen something other than the sustainability certificate program, maybe it's the uh, community aspect of working with a local farm, for example. I use that one because I'm pretty excited about local food systems, right? So what how does that indicate the value that we place on a certain idea or a certain practice or a certain way that we teach? That can be a way to identify that. A couple of other questions to use this map for. If you took that same map and uh, brought it into, the, let's say it's a map of your program, let's say you're a teaching faculty in environmental studies and you bring your concept map of your, your program or your course, and uh, somebody else takes a look at it, um, they've done the same thing, map, mapped out the same course or the same program, would they create it the same way? Hint, the answer is no, <laughs> right? We each come to this, uh, this practice of educating for sustainability with uh, our own minds, our own backgrounds, our own visions and goals, so not everyone is gonna create the map in the same way. Okay, so what follows from that, though, is having that insight, what opportunity does that create um, to help us perceive the values that we place on teaching sustainability within our own educational context? Again, whatever that is, wherever you are in the university. And what I mean by that context is we have our educator context, right? Um, if you've done any reflection on your own practice as an educator, you might identify with a certain school of thought. Um, if you come to it from psychology, for example, there are various uh, theories about learning and behavior having to do with sustainable, sustainability and sustainable practices. Um, so you have your own assumptions, biases, uh, blinders, um, hopes, dreams, and visions about your own practice, and that comes with you into your teaching. Um, it happens at the scale of the learner, too. 
uh, what you you know you go over ten concepts of sustainability say and you can identify three that you feel are the most important the learner may or may not feel that those are the most important three concepts to them so the learner has their own context um, there's the context of what classroom what laboratory what fields you're conducting this education in um, it depends on you know what is the environment of your building or department what's what's the culture of your department what's the culture of your school or college in which you teach what are the priorities of the university system uh, what are the priorities of your local or regional community in other words who does higher education serve there what are the larger issues what are the larger opportunities for conducting this work in the local or regional community what are the bigger economic and socio-political pictures going on right because education doesn't happen in a vacuum it always happens in some kind of a context what's happening outside of the textbook or outside of the walls of your university that uh, creates this context what are the religious or philosophical assumptions or values that create that context and of course the global so at multiple scales, you have a context in which this learning is taking place, right? So um, not sure how many of you have worked with logic models before. Um, I don't want to make the assumption that every educator knows what a logic model is or knows uh, you know, what they're for or how to use them effectively, but uh, I just want to make a, a suggestion here that um, a logic model can be a way to identify um, a pathway to aligning uh, the values and the practice of sustainability. Um, if you consider sustainability as a value that you would, well, let me back up for a second and just explain a logic model very, very briefly to those of you who ha might not have used one before. Um, this diagram is from a document I wrote during my uh, master's program in 2011 um, called Spider Sustainability, a plan for sustainable leadership, in which we created a logic model for our own professional sustainability plan. In that logic model, um, here it's represented as a stone creating ripples in a pond. So that's what the visual imagery is uh, supposed to communicate. The inputs are the, the things that you put into a program, um, such as staff members, uh, content, knowledge, um, means of delivery, uh, maybe the campus itself, um, that you do something with, right? That's the activities, the uh, delivering of course content, the field excursions, the research, et cetera. Those can all be activities. The outputs are what you get immediately from that, whether they are lab reports, um, uh, research studies, etc. Outcomes may be a more um, a more robust uh, recycling and waste prevention program, or they may be um, x number of uh, more graduates of a particular uh, environmental program. And impacts are kind of the wider view of what, uh, what great and important uh, change this might affect in the real world, um, such as the community come, becomes more well, or um, you, know, you have students go out and change the world for the better. That's basically a, a visual way to represent the whole, the whole process. So the suggestion with this is that if you consider sustainability as a value that you as an educator input into your teaching that that will affect like the ripples in the pond everything that you do and everything that your learners do with that um, my little sketch of a logic model certainly is not the only one Again, some of you are going to be really familiar with logic models and can probably do them in your sleep. But if you have not, um, or if you would like to learn some alternate explanations and usages of 
logic models. Um, a couple of resources here for you, especially especially helpful, I think, for sustainability pedagogy because you can find logic models for lots and lots and lots of things and spend hours and hours on the internet sifting through logic models that are not necessarily useful to you. But as far as sustainability pedagogy, uh, I found two that were um, very specific and one that's more general that I found to be helpful. Uh, the Center for Green Schools National Action Plan on Educating for Sustainability is a really well-written document. It's available for free online as a PDF. Um, the Place-Based Education Evaluation Collaborative um, did a, a couple of really neat publications a, a few years ago. Uh, I believe Antioch University was involved with some of those. Uh, has a, a great resource guide on logic models for PEEC programs. Um, and that actually has a few different logic models, so it's kind of nice to compare some of those. And then um, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation Logic Model Development Guide, which is probably one of the most frequently cited publications on logic models. Um, it's several years old now. Actually, I think it was 2004, 2007, something like that. But it's been used so frequently, it's a really good guide to go on. And why would you want to use a logic model to identify the the value of um, sustainability and, and talk about value in sustainability. As Yogi Berra said, if you don't know where you're going, how are you going to know when you get there? So, okay. So at this point, we're transitioning over to a, a section that I'm calling Head, Hands, and Heart. And I'm going to be asking people to contribute to this, the discussion um, a little bit more at this point. So. As we are going through this next section, um, try to think of some answers to these questions or some questions of your own to contribute to the discussion and just type those into the chat and Tom and Ira can bring those up. And so going back to the um, description of this webinar and talk about how um, you know, we, we kind of understand the, the head of sustainability, right? This is the academic content the knowledge that we're trying to impart on learners, um, helping them to know what sustainability means, what sustainability development goals are, getting not just students but educators up to speed on what is the status of the sustainable development goals. How do we measure sustainability? Those are, those are the types of questions that uh, the head is concerned about um, when it comes to sustainability education, right? The hands part is how we actually deliver and apply that education. So those are questions like, how can I embody sustainable behavior? How can I promote sustainability behavior? Uh, what are the skills and tools that I want to be able to use? Right? Um, and the head and the hands are super important. Absolutely. And they will only go so far if they're not also working with the heart. Those are the, those are the values. They may be expressed values, such as in your course syllabus or your curriculum guide or the, um, uh, what do they call that, the uh, academic guide that comes out each year that talks about the mission of the university and its vision. And maybe that in that catalog, it's actually broken down by department or by program that says what are the values of the environmental studies program or the economics department or the athletics program or whatever it is. But they might just be embedded too. Maybe it's not written down anywhere, but you know that you know school A has a really strong um, culture of sustainability and that shows through in what they do. That's what I mean by embedded values. So those, those kinds of questions are why is sustainability important to me or to my worldview or to my social ecological system? Maybe a simpler way of saying that is, who or what is sustainability for? You could change that term there in, in sustainability and say, who or what is an economy for? Right? Speaking back to David Suzuki, who or what is food for? Who or what is clean water for? Who or what is transportation for? So those are the kinds of questions that are, that are more heart-centered. Okay, so here's another try this experience um, to bring back to um, your own individual practice, <clears throat> excuse me, or to that committee meeting or to the classroom. 
You can also use this for program evaluation. Um, the head would ask, what do we want to teach or what's important for our students and colleagues to learn about sustainability? Hands would ask, what do we want to teach or how will our students or colleagues get the best practice with what they're learning? And the heart question would be, why do we want to teach this? What's the value of this for our students or colleagues in the context of our shared learning environment? And I point that out one more time, that heart question, because that's often what gets lost, right? As you're developing the uh, sustainability certificate program or you're developing the sustainability studies minor or you're even just you know planning next year's course, reflecting back on last year's course, um, we're pretty good as academics at asking the head questions and even uh, the hands questions for some of us. But often we leave this off. We leave this off our maps. The question of why are we doing this, right? We have assumptions about why we're doing this. Maybe we express them, maybe we don't. But we don't always take the time and the practice to actually do that and communicate that. And uh, it's not always an easy one, but I put it there uh, with the suggestion that you incorporate that at least once every year into your practice. So um, as an example, when I was introducing myself and I said how I identify and what I try to practice and then what I'm trying to cultivate, I realized that those are my head, hands, and heart questions, right? So I identify in these ways. This is like what I talk about, what I think about, what I try to communicate. That's up in my head. And then on the ground with my hands, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to cultivate community. I'm, I'm trying to uh, deliver experience-based learning. Uh, food systems is the way that I do that, but other educators will do it in different ways. And then in the heart part, that's, that's what I really, really value. I'm, I'm looking to cultivate that learning environment that fosters resilience. I'm, um, I put value on critical thinking, on systems thinking, and e ecological thinking. So that's just my example. For you, it's going to be different. Okay. So here we get into the hard questions. Take out that scrap piece of paper if it is helpful to you in articulating your thoughts here, because this is how um, I will hope that people will, will be able to contribute. Um, these hard questions, I should say, are inspired by a, an author named Susan Piver. She wrote a very short book. Um, that's uh, kind of a half book, half journal, uh, called The Hard Questions for an Authentic Life, 100 Essential Questions for Designing Your Life from the Inside Out. <clears throat> and I'm not suggesting that it, this webinar will help you to design your life from the inside out necessarily, but maybe provide a way to design your sustainability pedagogy, your practice, um, beginning from, from the inside out. Um, so he, here's some hard questions, and I say that they're hard because it really takes uh, some deep thought and in most cases some experience and maybe even some trial and error uh, to, to get these down. Um, can you articulate your values as an educator for sustainability, what's important to your practice and how that comes through in your teaching? Uh, it, can I always do that, or are there certain contexts that it's easier to do that and not others? For example, if you are coming to sustainability with a background in science, technology, engineering, and math, can you articulate your values as they relate to, um, say, policy or decision making and leadership? Uh, what can I say about my own professional orientation to sustainability? It might be a, a little bit more streamlined way to say that. So copy these questions down. Um, and use them <clears throat> to formulate some comments or some questions and just jot those, jot those down in the chat box. Here are some questions to bring up with colleagues as you're planning that next course or planning the next field experience. Currently, how or what role does sustainability play in thinking about curriculum development or faculty professional development? Right? Assuming that not everyone at your college or university is 
highly trained in sustainability pedagogy or a sustainability curriculum development or that you have some need for professional development with sustainability, um, maybe a question you should ask first is currently what role are, does that play in how we think about it? And then going one level deeper, okay, how did you how did you come up with that answer? What evidence is that answer based on? So let's say your answer to the first question is, oh, we always, always think about sustainability when it comes to planning the next program or deciding whether to add a department or break up a department. We always think about sustainability. Okay, great. So what is the evidence that you're basing that on? What indicators do you have um, that, that tell you that something is valuable or not as valuable? Think back to your own experience. Provide some examples if you can. Put those in the chat box. Another set of questions is, um, let's say you strongly identify with sustainability as being a value in your uh, teaching practice. It's, you know, it's there in all of the documentation and all of the literature about your particular program or course or your university as a whole. Um, how much or how little does your practice actually reflect your values? Just because it's written in the documents, does that necessarily mean that it's always practiced or it's, it's practiced across the board? Um, is there a connection between your work and what you believe? If our sustainability values and our practices are not entirely aligned, what can we do to change that? Maybe that's the hardest question so far, right? Because um, if you're doing an awesome job of delivering education for sustainability and, you know, um, the, the faculty are on board, the administration's on, on board, the students are on board, and everybody really values this, fantastic. You're very, very lucky. <laughs> But if the value and the practice are not entirely aligned, which is probably the case, at least a little bit, what can we actually do to change that? Maybe you have some examples of uh, small or large changes uh, that you've seen implemented in your own university or at a conference or in the literature. Go ahead and share that. So that was the last of the really hard questions. I have another set of questions to follow that, again, you can bring with you. But at this point, I really want to make sure that anybody who has something to contribute knows how to do that and is able to do that. So I want to just take a pause and ask Tom if there are any uh, questions from participants. Uh, hi, Jess. I'm looking at the questions uh, area, and, and there is a comment made uh, regarding the original logic model that you presented and that um, this person mentioned their Office of Sustainability's whole program framework is centered on a logic model. But other than that, there are no questions that have been posted. I think your questions are uh, fairly major uh, and, and require some thought, so I think people might be still thinking on them. Okay, yeah, that's a good observation, Tom. Thank you. And also thank you to the participant for sharing um, about their logic model. Um, I also want to let folks know that because these are really big questions that I'm asking that, um, you know, and I'm kind of putting everybody on the spot here, frankly, um, to try to think about these questions. The intention isn't necessarily to, um, you know, have the right answers right off the bat and say, you know, if you're a good sustainability educator and you're good at what you do, then you should be able to answer these questions, right? Um, that is not the case. Um, I, I view these as more of part of a cycle. Um, so as educators, we are also learners, right? And we learn as we go, and we try things out, and sometimes they fly, and sometimes they don't, and then sometimes they fly for a little bit, and then they don't. Um, and we're constantly learning from that and evaluating that and informing our continuing practice going forward from that, right? And sometimes we've got to ask bigger questions. And so the intention, again, is to introduce these questions uh, as something that you can incorporate into a reflective practice as an educator and something that you can use to um, spark a discussion, if you're not already having a discussion, at your institution about what sustainability means, what value it has in terms of uh, teaching and learning. Um, 
So continue to think on those questions and, and do uh, provide examples or just as good would be questions or problems that you're having at your institution related to these questions. But um, yeah, by all, by all means, take these questions and continue to you know toss them around and, and play with them in your own minds and in your own uh, educational community. So, okay. Jess, sorry to interrupt. There is a question that's just arrived. Yeah, I think this is the one that I'm seeing, Tom. It says, these questions can become an STC online dialogue on Collaborates, something to float as an idea. Um, so thank you for that. Um, if folks would be interested in taking one or more of these questions as a, um, a topic for one of the SCC's online dialogues, uh, definitely provide that feedback, whether in the chat box or in a follow-up email to SCC, because that's something that we would like to hear. Um, I obviously think that this content is really interesting. I think that there's a lot of educators out here with the same questions, whether they realize they're, they're grappling with these questions or not. Um, but the SCC online dialogue would actually provide a, a great format for us to explore these questions as a community. Um, I can let Ira talk a little bit more towards the very end of the webinar about what that online dialogue might look like. And um, I think most of you should be on our email list so that you can receive information about those when we, when we have it. Um, but that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Okay. So I have another question here. Um, this one's from Deandra. Hi, Deandra. Um, and she's asking, could you give some examples of how you articulate your values as an educator for sustainability? She says, do you mean in the large net that is EFS, the things or concepts that we're most drawn to? I really like including the three E's or someone else likes systems thinking or someone else likes place-based projects. So actually, Deandra, you've provided a, a couple of really good examples there. I think you mentioned the three E's, systems thinking, place-based projects um, as things or concepts that we're most drawn to. Um, I guess when I'm talking about articulating your values as an educator for sustainability, I am kind of thinking of um, writing a mission statement of sorts. So if you've ever been involved with a nonprofit organization or even if it's like a parent-teacher organization or a team of any kind and uh, you come up with a, a mission statement and this is a short like one or two sentence uh, statement that says, you know, what, what you're all about. Um, you, you may or may not be able to recite the mission statement of your organization or your university off the top of your head, but you know it's there, right? There's something that your organization stands for. So um, back when I wrote the sustainable leadership plan, that's where that logic model came from, that little diagram with the pebble, um, with the ripples flowing through the, through the ponds there. That was the first time that I can identify as a sustainability educator as having a mission statement of my own. Started thinking in that class, that education for sustainable, or the, um, excuse me, the sustainable leadership course that that project was for. Started actually kind of thinking of myself as an organization with a mission. And it was definitely like one of those um, very dramatic changes in my thinking it was really a paradigm shift for me thinking that way. So when I think about articulating your values, that's kind of what I mean. You know, if you were to write a mission statement for yourself as an educator, um, that's what I mean. The things that you're drawn to might be in that mission statement, but having that list drawn out before you write the mission statement uh, is another way to go, just to get you kind of thinking about what are the, the key um, parts of of your identity uh, as a sustainability educator, um, the key values that you bring to that practice. So anyway, Dee, I hope that answered your question. Um, you ask great questions there. So uh, if anybody else has additional questions, feel free to, to drop those in as well. <clears throat> um, the other thing that I want to mention too is that um, the recording will be available to review 
Um, just in case anybody has missed any of these slides or had to um, leave in order to attend other things, because um, it is uh, three three ten here. Um, the webinar is being recorded and it will be available through the SCC's YouTube channel. So, um, and of course, you can share that with your colleagues as well. Okay. So enough with the really, really hard questions. I have uh, for you an appreciative question. Um, during my second year in the PhD program, I took a look at appreciative inquiry as a way of researching and investigating kind of um, bigger picture questions. And again, this is a try this kind of exercise that you can bring um, back to your university. Is uh, the assumption being that there are other folks out there who are doing great work in aligning these values and delivering great EFS and ESD pedagogy. So the appreciative question is, what works, right? Where people are having success at that, what are they doing to get there? What's special about that? So the question is, what examples of EFS or ESD pedagogy can we find um, that, that do this work, this aligning of head, heart, and hands? And where those examples exist, who's involved, and what's, an especially, what's especially good about their approach? You might have some examples of your own. Please feel free to contribute those in the, in the uh, chat box. If you don't have an example right now, just take the question with you. Um, I have a question about why we should ask such questions, right? Because this is hard work. It's, it's hard work that we're doing. We have very busy academic and professional and personal lives. So why take the time to really dig deep into these really hard questions that take a long time to figure out? Um, another quote here, this is from um, one, of, one of the first books that I read about sustainability in higher education, uh, as well as a professional uh, educator, at least is uh, from Degrees That Matter, Climate Change in the University. Again, sustainability is much more than climate change, but that's a huge part of the picture, right? Uh, so this is a, a good book that I recommend. Um, so Anne and Sarah say, the university is an ideal learning laboratory, creating opportunities for hands-on experimentation and to exercise leadership. Universities can be responsible members of their communities. Universities can conduct research. Universities uh, can uh, educate both within their universities, the students that they teach, and the professional faculty uh, that they reach, as well as the broader community, and they can contribute to a more civil society. So it's important to ask these questions. Um, the next thing that I said that I would do is give you some faculty curriculum and development resources. You can see the first one on your screen now, um, but I don't want to jump too far ahead without making one more suggestion about those maps that hopefully you've been scribbling or those maps that hopefully you will take the, um, the time to scribble out uh, at some point. Is, uh, those maps can also be a tool for you to help identify leverage points within your university, within your community, within your department, within your educational practice. And that includes all of us who are here in the webinar and all of us who are not here in the webinar but out there in the university worlds um, trying, trying to do our thing, is to take a look at those maps and find those points where you can um, collaborate with another faculty member or where you can enjoin other folks that perhaps haven't been involved before in evaluating and informing the curriculum development process and the faculty professional development process. And, um, and try that out. Try, try making some change at that one point on the map and see how that change might spread throughout that whole map in ways that you might anticipate and might not anticipate. So that's the part about going back to the map and identifying those leverage points. Okay, so a few more resources here, and uh, I might have mentioned this book in my previous webinar, Higher Education and Sustainable, Sustainable Development, a Model for Curriculum Renewal. This book takes curriculum mapping to a whole new level. Um, it's written from an international perspective, which I think is really valuable for uh, North American institutions. And uh, in the introduction, it makes a really powerful statement that the time has come for the education sector to create 
this capacity for sustainable development, saying that um, it, it needs to transform curriculum, whether that's from the small scale to the large scale. This is something that you could introduce to your administration or your faculty and use as kind of a, a resource for navigating this process of change. Occupy Education is a relatively new book. I actually, it just became available through my university library, so I picked it up as soon as I could. Um, and I actually, I didn't pull a quote from the book for this one. I thought that the review comment on the book was especially poignant, um, that it challenges the normative practice of higher education. So it makes a critique of what higher education um, has become. Um, and whether, and it questions whether it, the, the traditional model will continue to serve in the future and takes a critical look at, um, at scholarship in, uh, in sustainability, especially with a critical theory point of view. So that's why I find it exciting is, again, I really value critical thinking and I identify with critical theory, so I'm excited by this book. Um, and then a third one, not quite as new, but uh, Learning for Sustainability is uh, a collection of uh, short chapters, um, a lot of different perspectives here, and talks about um, being uh, establishing an educational practice that is critical enough to learn constantly from experience enough, and, but also to keep options open in working for transformation in sustainability. So three, three of my favorite resources there. So, one more opportunity to ask if uh, people have additional questions or comments that they want to contribute. If there aren't, I will mention that Susan Santone's webinar is coming up uh, very shortly on July 19th. Um, and as Ira mentioned, if you've registered for this webinar, you've registered for the entire series. So, I want to encourage you to check out Susan's webinar as well. I joined her for her first webinar and really enjoyed it. So um, check that out on Tuesday, July 19th. Two more questions uh, the SEC is always asking of our participants, our members, um, the folks that we're working with, is what's the biggest challenge you face as a sustainability educator? And what do you need to support your work? Uh, in terms of faculty and curriculum development. Those are the two questions that we have on our webpage under the Contact Us webpage, um, things to keep in mind. And we love receiving uh, your feedback. Um, so please get in touch anytime with your thoughts on those two questions. And a couple of last quotes to leave you with. Um, Leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. John F. Kennedy. And uh, put just a little bit more strongly, in times of change, learners inherit the earth, and while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. So hopefully you will keep leading and keep learning, whatever your context is. And I want to say thank you once again. This has been a um, great experience for me, hopefully for you. Hopefully you find these practices and these questions valuable and would love your feedback. And at this point, I will hand it back to my colleague, Ira. Great job, Jess. I'm sure everyone on the line would agree with that assessment. Uh, as you pointed out in your penultimate slide, we are very interested in feedback on our webinar series and on our proposed activities. Um, again, please take a look at the SEC website at curriculumforsustainability.com. This is a particularly good time uh, to provide us with your input on uh, what your biggest needs and greatest challenges are because we're about to commence our strategic planning process for the upcoming academic year with our advisory council. We're thinking about uh, three complementary themes, pedagogy, content as in substantive topics and leadership and we would certainly welcome your input uh, on that structure. With respect to the online dialogues that SCC is pioneering, we've already completed one online dialogue 
relating to the role of higher educational institutions and UN initiatives. Um, an online dialogue in our definition is a combination of four components. Our identification of key resources for your use and enjoyment. Webinars with experts in the field. Follow-up Q&A facilitated by us on the Collaborace online collaboration platform and ultimately a co-created synthesis document also created on our Collaborace platform. So our next online dialogue begins two weeks from today. I am confident that each and every one of you could use to learn more about the components of the 2030 development agenda, in other words, the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Climate Agreement, and the Sendai Framework on Disaster Risk Management. That will be the focus of the next SC online dialogue. Registration for that is open now. With that, my thanks again to Jess for a great presentation and to Tom Bauman for fielding the questions. And uh, we look forward to having you join us in future activities.